Hello, everyone, and welcome to this MI webcast. I'm Jason Webb, Deputy Global Managing Editor at MI, and I'm delighted to be your host on this occasion. I would like to extend a particularly warm welcome to Andrea Enria, Chair of the Supervisory Board of the European Central Bank, who kindly joins us for a very timely discussion on the topic Euro Area Banks, Risk Outlook, and Supervisory Priorities. Events in March, with the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank and other banks in the United States, and the absorption of Credit Suisse into UBS here in Europe sent a shockwave through global financial markets. As central banks press on with their tightening core to combat inflation, these developments continue to pose the question, where else do fin financial stability risks lie and on what scale? And what is in the bankers, bank supervisor's toolkit to resolve these risks without their becoming systemic? We very much look forward to hearing Mr. Enria on his assessment and outlook insofar as the Eurozone is concerned, but also the broader risks posed by our interactive financial world. Our speaker today has a peerless track record with a lot of firsts. Andrea Enria took up his current position for a five-year term at the start of 2019, having been the first chairman of the European Banking Authority from 2011. Prior to that, he served in several banking analysis, regulation and supervisory roles at the Bank of Italy and the ECB. He became the first Secretary General of the Committee of European Bank Supervisors based in London. Thank you once again, Andrea, for being with us today. This m &I webcast is fully on the record. Our speaker will make some introductory remarks for around five to 10 minutes. I will then raise questions we've collated, some of them kindly submitted by our audience joining today. We also invite you to raise questions as we go along by submitting them via the chat box. I'll be monitoring this and can raise some of the pertinent entries. This m &I webcast is scheduled to run for up to one and a half hours in total. And I now hand over to Andrea Ria for his opening remarks. Andrea. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jason. And thank you for the invitation and to all of you for joining. Uh, I will keep my remarks uh, concise, as, as, as concise as I can. Uh, it's clear that uh, um, uh, the, the first point for me is the recent turmoil in the in the in the banking markets at the, the global level, I would say starting in the US. Um, I think this has been a, a powerful reminder no, of uh, uh, the, the challenges of a, a fast adjusting um, monetary policy framework, fast adjusting interest rate environment. Uh, uh, in a situation in which, of course, uh, uh, debt is still uh, on very on very high level from all uh, type of counterparts, um, let's say the uh, the events of uh, recent months have not uh, uh, highlighted surprising areas for supervisory attention to some extent. Interest rate risk in the banking book uh, uh, was uh, one of the uh, areas of focus that was uh, pointed to our attention by the events at uh, Silicon Valley banks, other regional banks in the US. Uh, and a lot of focus also went on um, uh, unrealized losses on uh, portfolios held at amortized costs. Uh, uh, these had been for quite a while already a, a, a point of supervisory attention for us. Uh, we started uh, uh, focusing on interest rate risk in the banking book at the end of 2021. We ran during 2022 a quite in-depth uh, targeted review of interest rate uh, and credit spread risks uh, at our banks. Um, and we focus very much also on the issue of uh, uh, economic value of equity. So the, the, the impact that increasing interest rates could have not only on the earnings of banks, which is generally a positive, especially for European banks, uh, but also on the uh, on their net worth, so on their uh, uh, long term, let's say perspectives, uh, especially linked to the uh, uh, performance and valuation of their assets, uh, irrespective and liabilities, actually irrespective of uh, the accounting books in which they are in which they are held. Um, a lot of attention also was attracted by, of course. Uh, um, sectors, uh, exposures to sectors which are particularly sensitive to, in, to the increase in interest rates. Um, 
like uh, uh, commercial real estate, uh, residential real estate. The focus on commercial real estate was particularly high also as a follow-up to the uh, turmoil in the, in the U.S. markets. This has been another area of uh, supervisory priority for us. We ran uh, target reviews and on-site inspection campaigns for a while. We focus a lot also on other sectors such as consumer finance, uh, uh, leverage finance, uh, and uh, um, on counterparty credit risk, because of course the amount of uh, the increasing indebtedness that we have experienced in the last uh, decade has been to a large extent also fueled by non-bank uh, financial, financial institutions. So uh, the, the areas of uh, focus were not uh, surprising or new. Uh, what was surprising and new to some extent has been the uh, extraordinary uh, size and speed of uh, deposit outflows. I mean, this has been a, an area that, that uh, in these days also we have seen publication of data for Credit Suisse and, uh, and, uh, and other banks in the US, also First Republic, I think, today. Um, I mean, this has been definitely something that uh, needs, uh, further, uh, needs further focus and further reflection also in the um, in the uh, supervisory community. Um, let me say, however, up front that I don't think that uh, uh, sometimes there is this reaction no, that you have a crisis, that you have turmoil, and you need to jump the gun and move to regulatory reforms. No, uh, I don't think that uh, uh, this should be the case uh, at this time. Uh, there might be areas in which we want to uh, review and maybe fine tune some uh, the calibration of some of our requirements. But in general, I think that the overall framework has shown that it is uh, robust. Uh, the key point is uh, the supervisor attention that need to, needs to be paid to some maybe uh, specific business models that, that have extreme features and uh, and deploy our supervisory tools you know, to maybe find a better coverage of these issues. For instance, in the case of Silicon Valley banks, uh, signature banks, there was uh, a, a particularly concentrated depositor space. So in those cases, you might need to, of course, uh, deploy your supervisory tools uh, uh, to deal with the specific situations rather than recalibrating international standards to fit a very extreme uh, business model. Um, all in all, again, um, we, we have argued for a long time that we don't see a, a direct read across from the events in the U.S. to into uh, banks in the uh, in the euro area. Again, uh, there were some outlier features of those business models that were at core of the turmoil that we don't find in in our in our uh, uh, let's say uh, environment. Um, uh, again, uh, banks that were very concentrated on uh, high tech uh, uh, companies, both on the size of uh, uh, on the asset side and those on the side of shareholders and uh, and, uh, and depositors and uh, 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 very concentrated depositors based uh, extreme exposures to uh, you know to unrealized losses. Also, this dual system that I understand is under review now in the U.S., in which uh, international standards are applied only to a bunch of uh, of uh, larger uh, systemically important banks, but not to uh, smaller banks, which is not a feature, as you know, of our uh, framework. So th there are a lot of uh, issues that do not uh, do not uh, um, appear. Um, and all in all, so far, we have seen that the increase in interest rates has played a positive role in uh, in, in the banks, uh, in European banks, PNL and balance sheet. Uh, uh, to some extent, it was a, a long awaited uh, moment to uh, beef up uh, interest margins and uh, uh, bring uh, uh, profitability and also valuations of European banks uh, in, in a better, in a better, in a better space. Uh, so there are indeed risks, as I mentioned, on which we are also focusing from a supervisory perspective, but our uh, assessment is that uh, on average, let's say, uh, the um, increase in interest rates remains a positive uh, for uh, for European uh, for European banks. Um, 
again, uh, maybe let me just uh, conclude by saying that another important aspect which has been uh, which has been been under you know uh, debating, which is being debated as a result of the current uh, developments, is the framework for the management of crisis. Um, um, uh, we have had uh, two, I, two issues. The first one is uh, uh, the um, uh, let's say the, the uh, deployment of uh, the tools that we have uh, in uh, locating losses in a situation of a crisis. There was this very, uh, you know, um, uh, specific decision taken by the uh, Swiss authorities, which I of course uh, respect and I am convinced is uh, perfectly in line with the contractual and regulatory features of that uh, environment, uh, regulatory environment. Uh, at the same time, let's say the uh, allocation of losses uh, to additional tier one investors, uh, uh, which have been totally wiped out in that uh, in, in the case of Credit Suisse, uh, while equity holders maintain values on their investment, uh, is something that created turmoil in the in the overall market, and we uh, came out, uh, you know, uh, asserting strongly that uh, this uh, uh, supervisory trigger feature, which is in a Swiss uh, additional tier one instruments, is not present uh, in any 81 contract of European banks, and that we uh, would, uh, by law, uh, respect uh, in resolution the hierarchy of claims, and we committed also to uh, respect it if there were to be, which I don't think will be the case, uh, any crisis management outside of resolution. The Commission has recently issued the proposals on crisis management, which are important, not targeting systemically important banks, but uh, more mid-sized, small banks. So we are strongly supportive of these uh, proposals. Uh, we think they could be an intermediate step towards the completion of the banking union, and I'm sure we will have plenty uh, to discuss on that topic. I would leave it here, Jason. Thank you. Thank you very much for those um, very useful remarks, um, Andrea. Um, interesting. Um, I know we're waiting the results um, of a stress test with a high interest rate scenario um, for later this year. So interesting that you uh, um, provide an initial assessment of, uh, of rising rates as, um, as a net positive for the European banking system. Um, nonetheless, amongst... Um, you mentioned that a lot of this wasn't a surprise, and of course, it's, it's you have been pointing to um, the risks from um, ra rising rates and commercial real estate for some time. But um, you did single out um, the speed of the outflows, particularly in this um, the deposit outflows. Um, and we had further news from uh, First Republic overnight about that, particularly um, given the capacity for digital uh, transactions, the way that news is transmitted um, across social media. Um, in the past, I think you've linked this to the liquidity coverage ratio. Could you perhaps, what, what sort of, what sort of parameters? Whilst, whilst you're not saying we need any 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 um, significant regulatory reform, what sort of parameters, what sort of calibrations could be uh, could be adjusted to take account of this um, um, surprising and slightly alarming development? Thanks for the question, Jason. Uh, I would say that uh, again, as I mentioned before. Um, we need to be careful no, in moving on uh, adjusting the uh, the liquidity coverage ratio the liquidity coverage ratio i think is a good is a very good metric um uh, i think uh, let's remind ourselves that the, the objective of this metric is to give authorities time no so to uh, create a window ideally one month no to um uh, to prepare solutions in case the crisis uh, becomes uh, entrenched, you know, to find solutions and uh, and uh, uh, plan for a smooth exit from the market if need be. Um, now, uh, if you if you if you roll back, for instance, to the uh, first episode of uh, uh, of deposit outflows at Credit Suisse in last year, uh, the, the the liquidity coverage ratio fulfilled its role. No, so it gained it uh, enabled the bank to have uh, the time to bridge uh, to a, a capital issuance that eventually, for some time, restored. Uh, uh, let's say stability at the bank. Then there were further news and further developments, and the situation deteriorated further. But let's say in that uh, situation, the liquidity coverage ratio worked uh, worked properly. 
There are some features of uh, some specific business model, like uh, high concentration of deposits. Uh, uh, there were cases of, you know, uh, investors that had uh, uh, more than three billions of deposits at uh, at uh, Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, uh, you know uh, that uh, uh, I think should not be covered via rules; should be covered more by supervisory. Uh, intervention. So, if you see as a supervisor that there is there are specific features, uh, you should maybe ask for higher liquidity buffers. You can do it. The uh, Basel standards are minimum minimum standards, and you can do uh, more of that. Uh, you mentioned the. Um, um, uh, let's say may, maybe the, the the issue we should uh, we should uh, investigate a bit further, and I don't have answers yet. Is uh, whether there are some. Uh, Type of depositors that showed a much higher uh, outflow rates than than calibrated in the uh, in the um, let's say in the international standards. For instance, I'm told by my U.S. colleagues that venture capital firms were particularly fast in running. So it might be that we need to you know look at a different type of investors and uh, look into that. But one point I want to make, which for me is the most important, and that I learn with some concern is that, uh, that there are a number of uh, uh, institutional and corporate treasurers that uh, look at triggers for deposits, uh, such as uh, stock prices or CDS spreads, uh, which to me sounds a bit, uh, you know, uh, uh, not, not exactly, you know, um, uh, I mean, there, there could be many drivers behind, you know, a depreciation in in, in stock uh, in, in equities, um, and not necessarily something that puts at risk uh, deposits. Uh, but this has been uh, these triggers have been particularly particularly uh, uh, strong in some cases, and uh, and especially if you look at the CDS market, I mentioned it uh, during the turmoil in March. I mean, sometimes you have single name CDS. Uh, uh, transactions, uh, very small transactions that they can uh, cause very uh, sharp moves you know, in illiquid and shallow markets, and then trigger you know, adjustments in stock prices, and then eventually even contaminate uh, outflows of deposits. So these type of dynamics uh, concern me quite, uh, quite a bit. And uh, I raise the point that sometimes these CDS transactions happen in OTC, uh, they're not very transparent, uh, might be taken also jointly with the uh, short positions on the equity. So that there could be dynamics that might be difficult to contain and could accelerate uh, financial instability. So as supervisors, as authorities, I think we should focus a bit on these aspects as well. So, so the main um, focus there will be looking at the CDS market rather than the, uh, you mentioned the link between equity prices and, and uh and deposits, but what you what you what as a supervisor you could look at more is is uh, or as 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 authorities what you could look at more is how the CDS market works and and reforming it. Yeah. That. yeah, and we can also think about as supervisor using more. To be honest, so far we have not used that uh, possibility very much, but the possibility of uh, in, in, in you know. Uh, uh, asking for additional liquidity buffers when we see that the liability structure of a peculiar bank is uh, is uh, uh, requiring you no know, probably uh, more uh, liquidity buffers because uh, deposits might uh, flow out uh, faster than for other business models. Oh, okay. So if they've got a high concentration of venture capital depositors or something like that. Yeah, something. Yeah, I see. I see. Um, you also, um, Andrea, before I go on to the questions, I see we're getting quite a lot of those. Um, before I go on, you mentioned um, the issue of the Swiss response on the uh, AT1s and the hierarchy. Um, obviously, um, um, the BOE was also uh, um, not uh, uh, not thrilled by um, by that um, development. Were there were there lessons in terms of coordination between international authorities in the response um, to a crisis to be learned here, um, or is it just the case that when these crises occur, the best laid plans always have to be adjusted 
um, in the heat of battle, as it were, and um, because um, I don't think anyone anticipated that the Swiss authorities would uh, handle the AT1s in this way. Well, I understand that uh, you cannot have, uh, you know, large uh, international debates uh, during a weekend in which you are trying to manage a complex crisis. Uh, I think the issue, the, the, the core of the issue is in the uh, international uh, collaboration beforehand. No? Uh, and I think that, I mean, I'm, all, I, I'm somebody who has always uh, believed a lot in international cooperation, uh, in the Basel Committee, in the international structures for cooperation. I think we, we need to strengthen these aspects uh, a, a bit more. I mean, for instance, in at the European Union, even before the start of the banking union, uh, we had at the EBA a, a strong collaboration, a team of, of experts, a network of experts that was uh, reviewing exactly the contractual features of additional tier one instruments to make sure that all the contracts that were issued in, uh, in Europe, uh, we had a, a common understanding, they were of good qualities, they, they uh, ensured uh, you know, uh, flexibility of payments, uh, loss absorbency, but also to look at uh, possible, I mean, that basically these instruments would have behaved in predictable ways uh, for, for all the banks uh, under the responsibility of, uh, of different authorities. So I think these type of mechanisms are very useful, no ex ante, to create a common understanding on how uh, losses should be allocated if something uh, bad happens. No? And I think these mechanisms were very useful at the European level. I would advocate something similar maybe should be... Uh, uh, established also at the, at the international level. Um, I can, I'll move now to some questions that I'm getting from our attendees because there, there's already uh, already quite a number. Um, one person, I'm afraid there is no name here, um, says the link between CDS and banks was also regarded as a problem during the global financial crisis, so 15 years ago. So why? Why are we um, spending, why are we still talking about that problem now? Were there not lessons learned there? How would you respond to that one, Andrea? Well, you know, it's a difficult question. I would say that in general, the uh, reaction to the uh, great financial crisis focused very much uh, on the banking sector because the banking sector was the core of that crisis, no, and was a major shock amplifier to some extent. So, um, uh, it's clear that uh, the reforms uh, uh, put a lot of attention on that. Uh, you can see, if you go back to the debates on those days, a lot of attention also to uh, other markets, uh, to other institutions, uh, and uh, which were maybe not followed up as uh, strictly as was the case for banks. I think the ECB has been uh, very vocal recently in requesting that uh, you know more attention is paid also to uh, these markets and and to non-bank financial institutions. So I think that uh, uh, times are right to you know uh, step up the regulatory cooperation internationally on those on those topics. Um, going back to the uh, to the question. Um, of the effects of uh, rising um, rising rates, I've got a um, a question from Julian Callow from um, from Rockos. Um, he um, asks uh, about um, the effect of bank profitability in a two year horizon um, when the net interest rate margin is. Could be when net interest rate margins could be compressing um, as banks have to um, raise deposit rates uh, to compete for deposits, um, whilst they also face a deterioration in their um, assets. Um, I, I'm not sure if the stress tests look at it over a two year horizon, but um, how would you respond to that one? Yeah, the stress test has three years horizon indeed. Uh... But in general, let's say again, uh, the um, let's see, and, and the stress test also is quite uh, uh, demanding uh, assumptions on uh, pass through you know, of the increase in interest rates to depositors. Actually, the banks were quite vocal in criticizing the harshness 
of, uh, of these assumptions. So I think it will provide some interesting uh, reading into the question of, of Julian. Um, in general, again, I think that uh, what we are, um, when we look at the projections of banks and we look at our own projections with our own models, uh, the, um, the positive effects of increasing interest rates on the earnings uh, is generally prevailing. I mean, we are also seeing an uptick, of course, in asset quality problems. It's clear that with increasing interest rates, uh, we will have at a certain point uh, uh, some materialization of credit risk in the balance sheets of the banks. Uh, but at the moment, let's say we still have for the next uh, uh, couple of years uh, a, a uh, projections that give a positive uh, that give a positive impact. Again, uh, this of course uh, uh, let's say relies on the assumption that banks are particularly disciplined and uh, and uh, effective in tackling asset quality problems uh, as fast as possible. Now that has been something that we have. Uh, uh, recall banks uh, for uh, you know uh, as a broken record <laughs> say in the last uh, in the last year so uh, we had been fearing a, 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 a an increase in, in in credit risk and in uh, non performing loans already starting uh, uh, from the pandemic uh, this that increase didn't materialize but we still have asked banks to you know beef up and strengthen their credit risk controls and to be able to identify problems very early manage them proactively very early, uh, providing solution for customers and avoiding that we pile up uh, asset quality problems as in the past. So if, uh, if there is a disciplined, uh, let's say, approach uh, uh, to managing trade risks, uh, we think that still uh, the trajectory should be, should be positive. That in the baseline, of course, uh, we will see from the stress test what would happen in a, in a, in a very adverse scenario. Getting a few more questions regarding um, bank profitability, um, which is of course um, an entire an entire subject in the eurozone, as you're um, as, as you're aware. Um, a question on the unwind of Teltro um, liquidity, particularly in the peripheral peripheral banking system, where there is a mismatch of excess liquidity vis-a-vis -vis Teltro uh, borrowing. Um, how do you see? Um, um, the unwinding of Teltro's, um, uh, um, which is which is coming up, and um, how how might that affect banks? Well, that is not a surprise, is it? I mean, so it's something which has been announced uh, with great, uh, uh, let's say, uh, prior uh, time lag. Uh, banks have had time to plan how to how to uh, you know uh, start uh, reimbursing the uh, the Teltros funds and uh, find uh, uh, alternative uh, funding sources. We have placed again already starting last year a lot of attention as supervisors in reviewing the funding plans of the banks uh, with a particular focus on the uh, on the Teltros. Uh, we have seen that uh, the process so far has, uh, has, uh, has moved pretty uh, orderly, so we have not seen major, uh, major recaps, and we will keep following this closely. But at the moment, let's say there is no flashing light that we are seeing in that direction. Um, the, um, more, more broadly um, on this subject of um, profitability, um, it's been a long-standing problem uh, for Eurozone banks um, since the uh, financial crisis. Um, I think that um, the forecast for ROEs are at about um, 8%, assuming credit losses um, remain constrained, remain con contained. Um, this is obviously far below um, what we've seen in the, um, in the US. Um, how far are banks on the road towards healthier business models? And how do you see the chain, the challenges remaining? Um, I suppose part of this, we've also got the um, proposed European Commission. Well, that's probably a separate question, how that might the proposed European Commission legislation might affect um, what impacts that will have on business models. But broadly then, how far are the Eurozone banks on, on the road towards um, revising um, their business models to make them healthier. How do you see that? 
I, I, I don't want to provide an excessively rosy picture here, but let's say I've seen progress, honestly. We have been uh, uh, very hard also in uh, criticizing the sustainability, the lack of sustainability of uh, or long-term sustainability of banks' business models uh, uh, since uh, 2017, when the ECB made the first review of business model issues, we identified, uh, uh, let's say, a lack of focus in investing in new technologies, uh, um, issues in terms of uh, cost efficiency, uh, inability to focus business models or to get out of uh, uh, business lines that were not, uh, uh, you know, uh, ensuring sufficient uh, uh, remuneration of the capital invested. So um, I, I think that uh, in recent times there have been uh, important, uh, important uh, positive uh, developments and uh, for instance, I mean, again, we have not seen uh, maybe as I would have expected more uh, uh, full-blown mergers no, in, 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 in the European landscape, but we do have seen a lot of uh, uh, business line transactions no, with uh, banks that were exiting some lines of business and other banks that were trying to achieve more scale uh, in, in those line of business, so in, uh, in asset management, in custody business, in leasing, uh, 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 in uh, uh, also in, in some lines of investment banking business, structural equity. So, I mean, there has been quite a lot of uh, reshaping of business models. Um, we have seen uh, more uh, forceful actions on uh, costs. And, uh, uh, and this is now with the uh, change in the interest rate environment, uh, we see that uh, uh, many banks uh, are in their three years plans are projecting rather credibly, I would say, uh, uh, to go to double digit return on equity and to finally uh, earn their cost of equity, which is uh, unfortunately not the case uh, for uh, uh, since a long time. Um, so, uh, 8% of return on equity you mentioned, I'm not, I'm not sure, but anyway, would in, is in any case, we have seen already in 2022 the highest return on equity on record since the start of the banking union, so the trajectory is, is, is okay. Uh, Q1 this year, I mean, banks are announcing results uh, in, these, uh, in these very days. Q1 has been another positive uh, quarter. Um, the uh, drag on uh, profitability that was exercised by asset quality, by the legacy of non-performing loans is now basically dealt with. Uh, we have an average uh, NPR ratio at 1.8%, which is the lowest uh, ever recorded. Um, and uh, even the banks which had uh, much more significant legacy issues have continued, uh, you know, dealing with the topic and securitizing also during the pandemic and during the crisis. So I, I, I'm, I'm pretty positive on the fact that, uh, you know, I mean, we have had in the last, uh, I mean, since I started uh, at the ECB, we had, uh, you know, a pandemic, a war, a, a fast accelerated uh, uh, adjustment in the interest rate environment. So everything is moving so fast. So I cannot rule out there might be other shocks that uh, once again, uh, let's say, uh, create difficulties, but the, I think the direction of travel is, is positive. And, and um, in, terms of, um, in terms of the shocks, um, one shock of, um, it's not a shock at all, but um, it's something which um, you've been actively working on, which is the final implementation of, um, of Basel III uh, um, with, with the nickname um, Basel, Basel IV. Um, what's, what's, what are the implications um, of that for um, banking uh, profitability? Um, given that banks will be a little bit constrained in the um, some of the more creative use of their internal models. Well, I, to, to be honest, I think that uh, the, the, the impact for uh, the banking sector as a whole uh, cannot be but a positive. I mean, if you have some banks that are creatively, as you mentioned, you know, or, uh, using their models, uh, you know, to uh, portray a, 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 an inaccurate uh, 
and uh, excessively uh, rosy uh, picture of risks. I mean, having a, a reform that puts every bank on a on a on a level playing field and makes sure that uh, uh, the function of internal models is uh, more robust, more reliable, and more comparable across banks. I mean, I think this should be uh, saluted as an improvement by everybody. In general, and also, you know, uh, there is this narrative that uh, the, the banks manage to, uh, uh, you know, to 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 pass in the in the general debate that uh, an increase in capital requirements uh, is, uh, you know, uh, uh, always uh, a negative for bank profitability, for lending, for growth, for jobs, for everything, basically. Uh, I would strongly challenge this. I mean, there is plenty of very serious research that uh, that argues uh, quite in the opposite direction. Uh, what happens is then when when you transition from one level of capital to a higher level of capital, of course, uh, uh, you have an adjustment which is uh, which might be costly and might be uh, also. Uh, 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 driving uh, some, uh, uh, you know, uh, reduction in the in the in the risk taking uh, by the by the banks. But once you have achieved the new steady state uh, level, let's say the bank is actually in a better position to withstand shocks, which is what we want. I mean, what we saw is that uh, in uh, 2008, banks had a poor capital position. Shock arrived major knee jerk uh, uh, risk aversion and uh, and uh, uh, massive impact on our economies for years which uh, brought the growth path on a on a much lower level uh, pandemic arrived i mean basically banks uh, did not uh, you know did not uh, uh, behave like that i mean they continued lending they supported their customers of course they were also you know a significant amount of uh, government guarantees that help throughout the process, but still, let's say they managed to uh, work as uh, shock absorbers, not as shock amplifiers. So having a higher a higher level of capital uh, eventually helps uh, the, the role of the banks in the economy. And there, once you are there, you no, know, at the higher level, their profitability will be driven by their revenue generation capabilities, their cost efficiency, and 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 the normal uh, drivers for that. But let me stress that this package was not about increasing the capital levels for all. I mean, this package is about increasing the capital level for those banks that inappropriately benefited from a uh, from a uh, use of internal models that put them at an advantage vis-a-vis uh, -vis other banks. So, distributional effect is what matters more than the average. Uh, Everybody is always focused on the average, but actually, is resetting the level playing fields across banks, which is the most important uh, point for a regulator, of course. Um, on, on the subject of uh, of, uh, of creativity in the banking industry, I think in the past you've you've um, you've accused uh, it was it was a while ago, um, admittedly, um, you accused banks of gaming stress tests. Um, do you think there's still some of that going on? Well, I hope not. I've not yet seen you know the the the, the results of this year. You know, the team is still engaging with the banks uh, for the first after the first submissions. Uh, but in general, you know, the, the, it, it is important that uh, in, in this repeated game, you know, that now we are having uh, regularly with, with, with the banks, uh, that uh, that uh, that banks uh, really um, uh, do not uh, uh, low ball, you know, the first submissions, maybe looking at each other, and, and that they play. Uh, uh, fairly, this 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 uh, this is an instrument also for for them, you know, to have a, a proper a proper feedback from their supervisors on uh, on their risk profile and the risks which are on the on the horizon. So I think I'm confident that banks will play, let's say, will play uh, a positive uh, uh, interaction with uh, with our teams throughout the stress test, and they will come out with uh, with the reliable results in July. Um, just, just before moving on to some more um, questions from our uh, audience, um, and this is a bit beyond your remit. So we're, we're now, but we're now implementing the final part of of Basel Basel Three, um, the um, eurozone banking system with much lower MPLs than um, than, than than a few years ago. 
um, much more closely regulated. There are still there are still um, there are still some uncompleted um, pillars of banking union, but it's in a much stronger way. Um, how worried about are you that the risk has simply been squeezed into other parts of the financial system and outside? So, so with all the the debt which you referred to earlier in your um, in your comments, a you know, very high debt environment. Um, you squeeze the risk out of banks; it just pops up like a balloon somewhere else, and then infects the banks. How do you um, how do you think about that broader broader issue of a very high debt world? Okay, be, be, before we move away from the Basel from the Basel discussion, let me use this opportunity to uh, launch launch another plea uh, for our co-legislators to stick as much as possible to the Basel standards. Now, if there is a lesson also from the uh, case of the regional banks in the U.S., no, is that uh, uh, it might seem a good idea, no, in good times. Uh, to uh, you know, to have maybe some banks which are not under the limit of Basel, as it was the case for regional banks in the U.S., or to have banks like in the EU which are under the limit of Basel, but the Basel rules being watered down somewhat here or there to uh, address uh, uh, supposed specificities uh, of uh, this or that banking sector. No. I think eventually when there is a crisis, there will always be somebody saying, oh, that that, uh, that bank uh, would have fared much better if it had uh, been in line with the Basel standards. And this will come back and haunt regulators and legislators if you don't stick to the Basel standard. They are, they are not, uh, you know, I, I will not send them as the, the Bible, no, they, they, uh, but still they are the best that we manage to construct as a regulatory community globally. And it is important that we strive to st stick as much as possible to that in all jurisdictions, including especially for me, the European Union. Uh, your point is absolutely spot on. It's clear that, uh, uh, again, the, if you look at the level of overall leverage of uh, the final sector, so households, corporates, and governments uh, in 2010, and you do the same snapshot now, the level of debt has increased significantly. The level of leverage of the banking sector has decreased, so it means that some of this leverage is being uh, fully financed uh, not by non-bank uh, uh, financial institutions. So the issue of uh, uh, potential role that this sector could have in a, in a new crisis is uh, something which is uh, really still uncharted waters for us. Um, so from my perspective, uh, let's say, uh, I know that our colleagues on the central banking side are focusing a lot on the risk, which are on the potential for systemic risk uh, in the non-bank financial institution sector. As supervisors, we focus very much, our entry point, let's say, in this, uh, in this debate is counterparty credit risk. I mean, so the, uh, the, the interface between banks and non-bank financial institutions, of course, especially in the counterparty credit risks area. And this is where we have done a, a, a huge, a significant supervisory effort, both in terms of reviews and on-site uh, on inspections. And uh, we identified uh, some issues, both in terms of origination and monitoring uh, of counterparts uh, in terms of uh, uh, you know of uh, stress testing of these uh, of these positions uh, so uh, we, we 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 have done a lot to strengthen also these uh, these uh, safeguards but this is indeed an area where maybe also globally the financial stability board uh, uh, should focus more as they have announced recently right um I'm just going to turn to a few questions from um, our audience. One from Gertjan Flieger, uh, former former um, member of the Bank of England's um, uh, MPC. Um, it's more of a more of a philosophical one. You say that the US has a dual system and the European the euro area doesn't, but only large banks are supervised centrally in the eurozone, smaller ones nationally. Is that not effectively a dual system as well? Well, in terms of the regulatory, uh, regulatory framework, no, no. I mean, the same legislation applies to all. We have the, uh, the, the, the capital requirements directive and regulations. The capital requirements regulation, where the bulk of the prudential requirements are, is legislation binding for all banks in the in the European Union of all sides. No, so there is no 
there isn't uh, this uh, this type of uh, this type of different. We have uh, uh, the 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 uh, the concept of proportionality, which is a sort of constitutional concept in the European Union. So we do have a number of areas where we apply you know, lighter uh, processes uh, for smaller banks, but uh, let's say all the uh, international standards, liquidity coverage ratio, net stable funding ratio, the capital requirements, uh, uh, let's say, are applied across the board uh, to all authorities. Also in the banking union, I would say that although it is true that we uh, are focused uh, directly and uh, supervised directly uh, 113 banks, if I remember well, at the last count, uh, uh, while the others are supervised uh, uh, by the national authorities. Uh, we do have a number of functions also for smaller banks, and we do have an oversight function at the ECB, and we work very closely with the national authorities also for the supervision of less, what we call less significant institutions. So there is a, a much more unified framework, I would say, in that respect. Um, turning to the broader question of banking union and also um, uh, crisis management, um, the ECB um, has welcomed the uh, Commission's proposed legislative changes to the uh, crisis management and deposit insurance um, uh, framework. Um, how far does that take us? And um, what, um, how, how how much still remains to be done for the eurozone to be completely um, as well as strong as it can be in a crisis, and how far does this European Commission um, do the European Commission proposals go towards your own um, um, go to what you would like to see? And do you have any reservations about them, or are they or are they as you like? I think yeah, I. I, I... I think the European Commission proposals is a, is a good step forward. Is not, let's say, by itself, let's say, uh, the, the the end game in terms of uh, in terms of uh, the process towards the banking union, but it has uh, an impo some important features that I would like to stress. First of all, let me say that uh, it is important to, to to stress that we are not in a situation in which we need to repair something because. Uh, what we have right now is dysfunction. No? So we don't have a, a system that has uh, uh, proven not to work uh, in case of crisis. We have had, uh, uh, unfortunately, let me say, our fair share of uh, banking crisis in the in the last uh, in the last years. Admittedly, mostly uh, small, but also medium-sized bank like. Uh, like uh, Banco Popular. So to some extent, uh, the, the the system the system works. Um, but there is a, a, a topic that we have a fully uh, European system for the larger banks that go into resolution, but for the small and mid-sized banks that uh, are basically uh, going at the moment into liquidation under national regimes, we have a, 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 a very different uh, approaches. This is also a problem for us no? as, a, as a supervisory authority, because sometimes uh, we declare a bank failing or like to fail. This bank goes into, uh, is not considered as, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, in the box, you know, in terms of public interest assessment for resolution. So it's left to the national liquidation processes. And there you have the, the wildest variety of practices in terms of, uh, possibility to deploy the deposit guarantee scheme uh, to fund a solution to the crisis in terms of the possibility to trigger liquidation. We have had cases in which a bank was declared fail or like to fail, but uh, uh, the court didn't consider the liquidation test being uh, achieved. So you have the sort of bank that was in a limbo, no? <laughs> not uh, failing, but not uh, to be put into liquidation. Uh, so there are a number of... Uh, and we have had cases in which banks, which were not considered of public interest no, at the European level, were, however, considered of public interest at the national or regional level and therefore benefited from liquidation aid in, in liquidation. So this has created, in my view, a, a, a lot of uh, uh, practical problems, but also 
fueled the lack of trust amongst member states you know, uh, uh, on how their neighbor uh, would manage a crisis compared to how they are doing it. So having more harmonization in the rules on how to deal with the, uh, the exit from the market of a small or medium-sized bank, I think is an important step to restore this trust and build a common framework that could be a stepping stone towards the finalization of the banking union. Uh, a point I would like to make, I mean, when you step into the discussion of uh, crisis management arrangements, um, there are a lot of differences in preferences. Uh, I mean, I must say I myself would like to see in the legislation things which are not there, and uh, maybe I would have liked some to, to, to have been drafted differently, you know? But I think now the, the, the objective, I would like that everybody now focuses on the, on the main objective of this package, which is to put together three uh, very closely intertwined uh, uh, tools and objectives. Now, the first one is to ensure a, 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 the possibility to deploy uh, more widely deposit guarantee schemes funds in funding a solution of a crisis. So not only in paying out uh, uh, the depositors when there is uh, a bank default, but also in financing solutions, no? for instance, uh, sale of business, uh, uh, bridge banks or stuff like that. So uh, uh, using uh, deposit guarantee schemes in order to, uh, in order to uh, support a smooth exit of banks uh, uh, from, uh, from the markets. Um, the second point, which is linked to the first, is, of course, if you want to do that, you need to uh, get rid of the super priority for uh, the post-guarantee schemes. Otherwise, it would not work. No? Uh, so you need to introduce a general depositors uh, uh, priority and, uh, and, uh, and harmonize, actually, the hierarchy across member states, which is an important point also to move uh, towards the completion of the banking union. The third point linked to the, 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 to the first two is that once you do that, you can also use the deposit, deposit guarantees uh, funding uh, to bridge the gap to the 8% that would trigger the resolution fund, the access to the resolution fund. We have a, a big pot of money there, no, uh, which is contributed by the banks themselves, no, that uh, uh, has never been used so far to actually uh, finance uh, positive solutions uh, of the crisis. So using the DGSs to do that would be an important step forward. Uh, I always say that if we take uh, the sum of the single resolution fund and the national deposit guarantee scheme, we have the same ballpark figures than the, the FDIC in the US, but they use this fund much more proactively to manage crisis, while we uh, never use these, uh, these funds. And the final point is the least cost test. Of course, you don't want to use this money in a, uh, you, I mean, of course, you need to have, uh, it's, it's a key uh, uh, principle of international standards that you should always deploy deposit guarantee funds on least cost basis. So when it is, uh, convenient to do so compared to paying out, uh, not paying off uh, the uh, insured depositors. Uh, it is important that this uh, uh, principle is harmonized at the European level and exercised in the same way across, uh, across the, the Union. So if you take these four uh, principles, they, uh, you cannot take out one and keep the other three. No? So you need to have a full monthly of them. They are closely related to one another. So it is important that in the negotiations, we don't uh, uh, jeopardize this uh, unity of intent that would convey, uh, would deliver for us a much more, a much stronger and more effective uh, crisis management framework. Um, just in, in terms of the, um... The third pillar of banking union, which is uh, um, still delayed, which is the European deposit um, guarantee. Um, what, what's your reading on when we're likely to see that, if ever? Well, you know, uh, we don't have a role. We, I hope that we would have achieved, uh, you know, last year with the effort of the president of the Eurogroup in this direction, a clear roadmap with a timeline to get there. We don't have it. So at the moment, uh, nobody can answer uh, your question. Um, 
what is important for me to say is that uh, you know the reluctance of uh, governments or ministers of finance not to sign up to the uh, to EDIS, to the European Deposit Insurance Scheme, is that from the politicians' point of view, you have the impression that you are signing up a sort of joint and several guarantee on seven trillions of insured deposits. No? And that makes, of course, uh, uh, finance ministers hesitating a bit. No? So why do I think that uh, the reform that the Commission put on the table is important also in that perspective? Because if you have a, fun a well-functioning uh, uh, deposit guarantee scheme crisis management framework, as it is shown also in the US by the FDIC, no, you, you, you never use actually the fiscal backstop. I mean, the, the, the FDIC throughout the great financial crisis managed to close down, I think, more than 500 banks in the US, um, deploying the funds they had, doing purchase and assumption, then selling these franchises to investors, banks, in, sometimes in other states, and, and, and helping the consolidation, rationalization, and restructuring of the sector without ever triggering the uh, the fiscal the fiscal guarantee so eventually the fund was used and is now being uh, 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 replenished you know, by the contributions of the banks themselves so if you have a common framework for crisis management that enables finance ministers to understand that this can work effectively favor the smooth exit from the market without weighing on the public finances and then I think that they could sign up to EDIS uh, uh, with less hesitation going forward. I hope so, at least. Uh, turning again to a question from the audience, quite a straightforward one for you. Um, Andrea, how are supervisors dealing with unrealized books, losses on banks' books, and is there a concern there? Uh, look, uh, in a sense, uh, let me let me start for stressing some differences you know, from the uh, setting that we have right now and the setting that we have seen at play, for instance, in the uh, uh, Signature and Silicon Valley Bank case. You know? um, so first of all, um, in the case of regional banks in the US, uh, there was a possibility uh, not to... Um, uh, to reflect uh, on capital, uh, the depreciation of uh, assets held in the available for sale book. No? Uh, so uh, that was an option. And actually the banks uh, that we are talking about did not uh, map the, 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 the unrealized losses on the available for sale into capital. Uh, for all our banks, uh, this is not possible. No? So all everything which is in the in the in the available for sale goes to capital through fair value uh, through other comprehensive income so that that's a first important uh, difference and in fact if you see the overall size of unrealized losses at us banks and european banks uh, I, I think that it, there was a, a chart in the uh, published by the imf recently if you were to map all these losses into capital in the US, you would have a, a, a median impact of uh, more than 250 basis points. In case of the European banks, it's below 50 basis points. So that's already a big, uh, big difference in our regulatory framework. Uh, the second point is that uh, on the LCR, when we calculate the LCR, we assess these assets at uh, fair value, at market value. So basically, the computation of the uh, of the liquidity coverage ratio already includes uh, a, a market valuation. So the, the banks need to have a, a buffer that is on mark to market terms fulfilling the uh, uh, the requirements. That's another important uh, difference. I mean, the banks we were we discussing of in the US did not have actually the uh, LCR the application of uh, of uh, of the LCR. Um, so the um, the the, uh, the the unrealized losses, let's say, aspect is uh, is is in a different ballpark. That was my first part, but still is there. So we do have a, a significant amount of uh, of uh, 
assets which are held at amortized cost, and if the, the even in the in the sovereign portfolio, the, the sovereign portfolio in the banking book actually. Uh, for European banks, 75% of, of this uh, of this uh, portfolio is held at amortized cost. So this means that if tomorrow the banks were forced for liquidity reasons to liquidate this portfolio, uh, then they would have realized these losses. So this is an element of attention. That's why in the in the in our you know last year, for instance, we did throughout the year a number of. Uh, uh, of, uh, let's say, uh, shocks. We asked the banks to, you know, uh, uh, give us uh, their feedback on how a, 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 a standard 200 basis points uh, shock uh, on the interest rate uh, would have mapped into their economic value of equity. No? And that uh, we have been monitoring throughout the year as the interest rates were, uh, were, hiked, uh, were hiked up. Um, so this is a this is definitely a point of attention. With the EBA now, we are also collecting additional information within this framework of the uh, of the stress test, and this also because uh, sometimes we do have the amounts, but we don't have uh, very. Um, uh, very uh, detailed information on the hedging practices, for instance, of of banks. No, on this uh, uh, on, on the. Um, on the interest rate risk on these on these particular assets. So the information that we are gathering right now will enable us to have a better, more granular picture on interest rate risk in the banking book uh, through that uh, uh, through that channel, and will enable us also to do some sensitivity analysis. So to see also in different scenarios, including the scenario of the stress test, how the uh, unrealized losses uh, would move for different uh, for different banks. So it's a, it's a point of attention, but is again, as I mentioned, is something which we have been uh, uh, focused already uh, for more than one year right now, and on which we are engaging in a in a strong discussion with our banks. Um, we have a, a related question from uh, the audience uh, concerning the potential losses in bank securities holdings. How does the maturity of these compare with U.S. banks? I don't have a, a clear picture on the maturity in the U.S. banks, I'm afraid. So this is a question that should be addressed to uh, no, the IMF or other international organizations. Um, but again, I mean, the, the type of exercise that we do are generally, you know, these 200 basis point shocks, we do it uh, uh, in, in different, uh, I mean, we have a, a, a parallel shift in the yield curve, we have a tilting upwards, downwards, so we, 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 we have the, the, whole, the, the, the whole configurations of increases, uh, which enable us also to challenge uh, banks which have different maturity distribution of their, of their uh, books uh, at amortized cost. Um. Going back to um, the, um, the subject of um, banking union and the fact that um, um, European banks are still quite segmented um, along um, national um, lines. Um, uh, when are we going to see changes in that? And does this segmentation in itself provide some sort of risk um, back in the Eurozone, back in the crisis in 2012, talk was of the doom loop and of um, sovereign bank exposure, um, sovereign, um, uh, the, the exposure of banks to, uh, to bonds and, uh, and vice um, government bonds, of their own sovereigns and vice versa. Um, is there still any danger of that? And how concerned more broadly are you in systemic terms about the continuing national segmentation of the Eurozone banking system? Uh, you can keep me going for a while on this question. <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, um, I think there would be huge benefit from uh, achieving a greater integration of uh, banking markets uh, in the in the banking union. 
for a number of reasons, also in terms of profitability for banks, honestly. But I didn't say I'm a supervisor, so what I look at, of course, is the uh, is the are, are the tail risks. No, so having a, a more integrated market uh, would uh, improve the uh, the resilience of our banking sector in front of shocks. No, uh, if you look at uh, the banks uh, in the U.S., no, if you have banks that are operating in different states, if you have a, a real estate uh, uh, crisis in one state, as it happened, for instance, in uh, in uh, Nevada some time ago, uh, well, then you would have the banks which have diversified portfolios across states would be able to, you know, uh, uh, to withstand the losses in, in, in Nevada by, uh, you know, uh, compensating with profits in other, in other uh, real estate markets uh, across, uh, across the overall uh, federation. And in the European Union, we, we, we don't have that. So if you are very much, uh, you know, concentrated uh, or, or as portfolios in your in one you know, <laughs> uh, national market or even regional market, uh, if there is a major real estate shock, I mean the banks are going to uh, to to suffer uh, more deeply. Uh, it is interesting because it is also a shock absorber in terms of the possible solution to the crisis. Now again, when you have a shock hitting one one member state, you would like to be able to you know. Uh, fund solution to this crisis by finding potential buyers, no, for the assets and liabilities of these banks, also from other states. So uh, uh, the lack of this uh, is, uh, is, uh, is 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 indeed uh, an issue. So this is what uh, let's say uh, is usually called private risk sharing. So we don't have. Uh, 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 sufficiently effective, in my view, uh, private risk sharing. Uh, uh, elements in the in the banking union because of the segmentation of the banking market uh, uh, still in some uh, in some national pools now since i started uh, here we try to put a lot of attention in uh, if not favoring at least uh, uh, not hampering or uh, let's say uh, additional integration so we say for instance we we, we set out uh, a clear guidance uh, supportive all in all for mergers and we said clearly that uh, we would have used the, the same metrics now for uh, uh, domestic or cross-border mergers within the banking union uh, we have seen some domestic mergers we have not seen a lot of cross-border measures so far I think that the case for cross-border measures will become stronger if the profitability gets more uh, uh, you know uh, crystallized and, uh, and stable uh, going forward but for the moment being that's where we are uh, we said and it is still an open possibility for banks to consider that we can uh, uh, open up to uh, uh, brandification, for instance. I mean, we have seen, it was interesting because we saw that the banks that uh, moved to the banking union, to the euro area after Brexit from the UK, most of them used the branch structure. So they used a, a, a sort of central uh, uh, unit, no central uh, entity in the, in, the, in the euro area and then they integrated, they merged all the subsidiaries in the other member states into this unit, so uh, distributing products through branch networks. This would avoid any segmentation of capital and liquidity in terms of operation in the banking union. It's an option which is open also to incumbent European banks, so we stand ready to assess this as an avenue as well. So far, we have not received... Uh, uh, received any application. One of the stumbling blocks in this is the fact that there is no portability of the deposit guarantee scheme. No? So uh, once you pay the deposit guarantee scheme in one member state, if you branchify, you cannot move back to the uh, to the other state, uh, the, the, the funds that you have contributed to the local scheme. You can only bring the, 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 the payments of the last year. We asked the commission to take care of this uh, aspect in the legislation. Unfortunately, we didn't find this uh, Element in the in the recent package, but uh, and, and thirdly, there, there are limited. There is a limited space for liquidity waivers that would enable banks to you know pull more liquidity uh, for cross border groups. We stand also ready to uh, look into applications from banks in these areas. So far, not much has moved. I think banks right now are too much focused on basically returning capital to shareholders and. Uh, 
lifting their valuation so they're not that much into the mindset of expanding their franchise uh, in other member states. I hope that once uh, profitability gets more uh, stabilized, uh, we can see more uh, push from the European banks also in terms of integration. On the point that you were making on the doom loop, you know, the doom loop has, uh, has two drivers. You know? uh, one is uh, the, the, the being a loop. <laughs> one is the contamination from the sovereign to the banks. You know? So the, the sum spreads widening and these affecting negatively uh, banks in one area worse than banks in other areas. Um, these, uh, to some extent, again, diversification I was discussing before would already be a, a, an important safeguard. But in general, I would say that the institutional safeguard that had been put in place after the sovereign debt crisis, so the outright monetary transaction, OMTs, and more recently, the transmission protection instrument uh, have uh, enabled to go through a number of shocks without seeing uh, massive uh, shifts in sovereign spread. So this element is a little bit, uh, um, you know, less uh, is, is much less relevant today than it was uh, at the time of the of the sovereign debt crisis. Uh, the other element uh, is the contamination from the banks, you know, going to crisis into the into the uh, into the sovereigns. This is the the national nature of the safety net, basically. Again, we do have done a lot uh, here to uh, we have done a lot here to. Uh, remove also this channel. We now have a single resolution fund. So for the large banks, uh, you know, the uh, the funding is coming from a common, uh, fully mutualized fund that will be fully funded by the end of this uh, year. We also have a common backstop that has been agreed at the council level uh, from the ESM uh, to the uh, single resolution fund. So we are getting there in terms of uh, completing that uh, institutional institutional setup. Uh, we do have the uh, national part of deposit guarantee schemes for the small and medium-sized banks, as we were discussing before. And these, honestly, will not be fully uh, addressed until we move into, into EDIS. Uh, but having common criteria is already an important step forward there as well. But how um, how important is the portability of the national guarantee schemes compared to EDIS, the uh, European scheme? Would that would that in itself make a huge difference and encourage more cross border activity? Well, I mean, the, the portability is relevant only in a specific case, no, which is the branchification. So in the case in which you decide okay. to transform the uh, subsidiary into a branch, uh, so it's a pity that uh, it depends very much no, on uh, the amount of funds that you paid, uh, the amount of deposits you are taking. Uh, in the So it, it might, may differ from bank to bank. So for some banks, it might not be that relevant. For some other banks, it could be a... a, 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 a killing the deal, basically. So uh, would have been a helping, but it's not, uh, it's not so uh, material. So EDIS, of course, is on a much different scale in terms of uh, providing the support that would be needed to foster the integration of the euro area banking market. We, we have um, a question from the audience also um, on EDIS. It seems that we cannot get EDIS before banks diversify their sovereign debt holdings and governments appear unwilling to force that. How do you respond to that one? Well, my, my, my first uh, reaction is that indeed, first of all, we don't uh, we don't see any more right now in the bank's balance sheets the same amount of concentration on domestic sovereigns that we saw back in 2011. So this has changed already to some extent. Banks uh, have learned there has been some diversification. There is less con less extreme cases. Uh, of concentration that we have seen in the in the past. Um, I've been in the past also supporting institutional initiatives to favor this diversification, no creation also of uh, European uh, European uh, you know synthetic uh, uh, assets that would have helped uh, this uh, this process. But besides that, I would say that. Uh, uh, and this is also a reflection on the developments in recent times. No? Uh, um, 
in my view, the, 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 the most important step uh, in, in the direction of uh, making this issue less relevant would be having more mark to market in the sovereign portfolios of, uh, of European banks. I mean, uh, I understand that banks uh, keep at amortized cost uh, uh, a uh, significant part of their sovereign bond portfolios. I understand that uh, uh, they could still, you know, use these uh, assets uh, uh, for, uh, you know, uh, monetary policy uh, operations and uh, and get the liquidity they need through that channel without the need uh, to sell the assets in the market. Uh, but still, I would like, uh, if, if we were all able already to move in a, in a setting in which uh, banks uh, held, who were to held their liquidity buffers uh, at, uh, uh, at market values, no? uh, uh, that would already be a, a, major, a, major, a major improvement that would make this, uh, this issue uh, less relevant. Banks would manage, would be incentivized also to manage uh, the risk in a more proactive fashion. So diversification would also be more in their in their interest, and I think we would move in a different uh, in a different setting. Um, on the um, these uh, you mentioned the um, the TPI and the OMT, so we're um, sort of getting close to some of the other functions of the um, of the ECB beyond your department, um, and obviously one one. Um, enormous concern of the um of the monetary policy section which isn't your section of the um of the ecb but which regards you the um the, the the banks is the tightening of financial conditions are you seeing much um evidence of um what sort of evidence you're seeing of banks pulling in their lending in the eurozone what they've seen in the in the bank lending survey is that indeed in in the first quarter of uh, of this year there has been uh, a, let's say banks were planning to uh, tighten the uh, their lending standards and I expect that also in light of the turmoil that has uh, happened in March this has indeed occurred uh, in a, in a in some, to some degree, honestly, I don't have uh, and I don't monitor uh, very closely uh, these uh, these data. So I would expect that there has been some tightening. We have already seen uh, already at the end of last year that in some markets, uh, uh, for for instance, in the residential real estate market, the lending conditions in some member states uh, were uh, massively tight. And so the tightening is occurring. It's a natural, uh, you know, uh, uh, element when you are in a in a monetary policy normalization uh, framework. So um, at the moment, uh, it seems that it seems to me from again, I'm not uh, in uh, dealing with monetary policy issues as you correctly uh, uh, pointed out. But it seems to me that uh, the uh, tightening process is uh, occurring uh, uh, in line with the uh, with the uh, let's say with the expectations of our colleagues on the other side of the building. And in terms of um, the uh, the cycle we find ourselves in, you mentioned earlier um, CRE, commercial real estate. Um, could you say a little bit more about about um, the risk to banks on the, from commercial real estate, particularly as the, um, the monetary cycle continues to tighten? We, we we have had uh, an intense supervisory focus on commercial real estate, uh, also because uh, we thought already starting during the pandemic uh, that uh, there would have been a, a structural impact on the sector coming from uh, you know uh, especially the, the in the in the office uh, segment uh, coming from the increased reliance on uh, remote working. Which more most uh, uh, you know most uh, uh, firms are now rely on, um, and uh, uh, a, a, a more conjunctural impact coming from the tightening uh, cycle in uh, in interest rates. No? so we had a lot of uh, focus on this sector. It was one of the first on which we uh, focused our attention. 
Um, we looked a lot at the risk management practices of banks in this area. Uh, we identified uh, uh, some issues, both in the uh, origination, for instance, the very extensive reliance on uh, uh, balloon and bullet loans, uh, uh, sometimes also the, um, um, you know, the, the um, uh, let's say the lack of skin in the game requested to sponsors no, of these of these of these projects. Uh, we have seen some weaknesses in the monitoring of the conditions of the counterparts, some weaknesses in the valuation of the uh, of the collateral. So uh, again, we have put a lot of uh, effort in terms of ensuring uh, good internal controls, good risk management uh, in this in this area. And uh, we still think that this is one of the sectors that will need uh, to continue uh, be at the center of uh, supervisory of supervisory focus. Uh, uh, I notice also that in the US now uh, there is a lot of attention on exposures to this uh, uh, to this market. Uh, but what is important again is uh, is to look at the uh, risk management practices by banks, uh, which have been. Uh, uh, significantly involved. Uh, for me, especially the point of uh, the, the, the extensive use of uh, balloon and bullet loans is something on which we should focus our attention quite a lot. Having said that, I must say that uh, the market so far has been uh, surprisingly resilient. So uh, it's some time that we have noticed that uh, uh, real estate investment trusts you know, that are usually uh, used as a predictor no, for the development of prices going forward have pointed to a, a downward adjustments in valuations of commercial real estate and this downward adjustment so far is not yet materialized, especially not to the extent uh, foreseen. So for the moment being, uh, we don't have yet a materialization of risk, but I think it is important to keep a focus on that. Um, I'm just getting another um, question from um, the audience. Um, it says, referring to your appearance before the European Parliament, um, there was a report suggesting that you were encouraging banks to um, mark to market um, sovereign debt holdings used for liquidity coverage uh, ratios. Um, is that is that accurate? Could you speak about that? Yeah. Well, uh, again, as I was saying before, no. Uh, again, I I I understand that. Uh, um, in principle, I would say that uh, all the assets <laughs> that are included in the liquidity buffers, uh, the banks should be ready to sell those assets at short notice. So in my view, uh, this should be carried at, uh, at market value. I recognize that, however, the, uh, the, the setting which has been designed right now is, uh, is uh, you know, uh, sustainable in a sense because you have a mark-to-market uh, for the purpose of the calculation of the liquidity coverage ratio, but the asset will be still held in uh, a, at amortized cost, basically. Um, also, because these uh, the, the the banks could still uh, you know use these assets as collateral in uh, central bank refinancing operations, so uh, the, the system now works. I remain convinced that uh, uh, a way of addressing the concern also on unrealized losses uh, would be uh, uh, much better addressed if uh, if you had uh, all these portfolios which are earmarked for the liquidity coverage ratio to be carried at market value. That's a personal opinion. Uh, is uh, nobody's listening to me, so don't, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you should take any indication of what they say in terms of what is likely to happen uh, on, the, on the regulation side. Um, we're, just, we're just approaching the end here, Andrea, and thank you very much. It's been really fantastic, but just see if we can squeeze in a few more, a few more questions. Um, so where do you see the risks coming from the non-bank financial sector, real estate investment trusts? Well, again, it's not my, you know, it's not my line of business here. Uh, 
Bank of England, for instance, also has responsibility for non-bank financial institutions. We are only focused on banks, so I don't see these uh, these entities. I I know that uh, say in some areas of the non-bank financial institutions, uh, our uh, colleagues in the uh, uh, in EOPA, in ESMANO, are, are monitoring risks uh, and uh, making also stress tests from time to time. So they, they, they are more uh, focusing on that. Uh, but uh, from my, from, I, I'm not uh, in, in a position to indicate anything. Our colleagues on the, on the central banking side recently have identified the commercial real estate, uh, uh, say, investors in commercial real estate, in, indeed, as one. Uh, a potential element of uh, scrutiny from that point of view. And just jumping around to another another issue, which is a big issue, but which we haven't mentioned so far, which is exposure to Russia. How uh, the conflict has been going on for quite a while now. How is the uh, your exposure to Russia going? The, um, I mean... Taking a, a purely prudential point of view, no. So, how much are the exposures of European banks towards Russian counterparts? Uh, these exposures are manageable. We already came out uh, uh, in the weeks after the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, showing that basically, if you were just to write down to zero all these exposures, I mean, these would not have uh, rocked the boat uh, in in any uh, in for any European bank. So the, the that they would have still been able to fulfill uh, the, the, the capital requirements. Having said that, let's say we have been uh, quite clear in our message to the banks that uh, we would expect uh, these exporters to be you know, downsized, uh, to be uh, significantly reduced, and ideally also the banks to consider uh, exit from that market, also because of uh, reputational risks. I mean, if you are in a market which is involved in such a uh, nasty war of aggression, I mean, although I know that many banks uh, operating there are very careful and engage mainly with the Western um, uh, counterparts operate, still operating in Russia, still uh, the, uh, the optics uh, could be that you are to some extent involved in financing the war effort. And so that there is a reputational issue, there is an issue of the uh, compliance with the sanctions regime, which again, I'm, I'm sure our banks are particularly careful to respect. So, but all in all, I think that at this juncture, uh, maintaining uh, a significant presence in Russia uh, raises uh, more risks uh, than than it should. So uh, I've not been particularly uh, pleased by the speed of reaction of uh, banks to these uh, recommendations coming to our side. The downsizing, the winding down of operations there has been uh, pretty slow. Uh, but there is a post, there are positive uh, communications which have been made by banks more recently. Many of them are really moving into a, a wind down uh, of a type of mindset, and uh, some are also trying to you know uh, find buyers for their franchises. So I would encourage them to accelerate uh, progress in that direction. Well, thank you very much, Andrea. Um, I think we're reaching the end of our um, allotted time. It's been really, um, really very, very interesting. I'd like to thank you enormously for joining us, particularly at such a busy and challenging time, and for providing us with an extremely thoughtful and helpful account of the key aspects affecting Euro area banks and their place in the wider financial world. I'd also like to thank our audience today, to thank everyone for joining us and invite you all to please disconnect. We at MNI wish you all the best and thank you very much again, Andrea. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Okay.